is up everyone jeremy here and i have a very special guest with me today she is an incredibly talented vocalist fronts the bands hyrus and critical mass and has a brand new extreme vocals course launching very soon that we're going to be talking about in this video everyone please welcome britta gertz Britta, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to chat with me today about Extreme Vocals and your new Extreme Vocal course. How are you today? I'm fine, and thanks a lot, Jeremy, for having me. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you. Uh, the pleasure is all mine, I can assure you, because uh, I've seen your work. I'm a huge fan of what you do. Um, and, and just coming right out of the gate with this, like we'll just jump straight into the Extreme Vocal course. But I am super thrilled about this course um, you know, obviously you are very talented and I, I have aspirations of, you know, being able to do vocals myself, uh, one day. And so I'm very, very excited to kind of dive into this myself and start learning uh, as part of this course. And so kind of jumping right into that, uh, my first question is, you know, who is this course ultimately designed for? You know, I'm coming into this as, as a total beginner, zero experience with, with extreme vocals. Uh, would this would I would this work well for me or is would should I have some form of like experience going into this? Well, um, I designed this course um, and aimed at absolute beginners. So the only thing that one should be capable of somehow is to breathe and to speak, I would say. Um, so we start really at zero and dive into like the breathing, the anatomy of harsh vocals and everything. So it's it's designed for absolute beginners. So it should be um, working perfectly fine for you. But also, of course, like for people who have some knowledge, who are self-taught, who just want to just like, you know, just like refine their technique or just get some deeper knowledge. Awesome. Great. So, so this will work for me. So, so great. That's good news. <laughs> uh, and so kind of diving into a little bit more about the course, um, can you just kind of give us maybe a high level overview of like, what are some of the techniques that we would be learning as part of this course? So, um, since this course is aimed at beginners, like I really started at, at, at zero. I started like explaining like how vocals are produced in the in the body, like which body parts we have, which body parts are resonating and and giving like us a voice. And then um, on top of that, like which body parts are we using to create like a distortion, a distorted vocals, harsh vocals, or like adding some grit and dirt to your to your vocals. So. Um, this is like the whole anatomy building up. And then we are diving into like a proper warm up, of course, because warm up is very, um, very important when you want to sing or when you want to do harsh vocals. And then um, I focus on the two basic techniques, which are false chord and fry technique. But um, for the fry, I have to say, like, um, there is not this one fry. There's actually like a, a variety, a family of fry sounds that you can make. And I'm trying like to just give an overview of that because I feel like in my daily work as teaching um, vocals, uh, I've, I come across many people who are very confused when it comes, to, especially to the fry technique. So um, yeah, you will get some clearance there, hopefully. Awesome. Excellent. Well, you kind of touched on a couple of things I want to dive into a little bit more deeply. But the, the first one is, um, again, you know, I'm going to say this probably a hundred times, but I'm a total beginner. And, and I would love to know more about like, the techniques involved in in doing different you know styles of vocals and maybe this is kind of what you were just touching on about how there's many different types of the fry technique but more specifically like the like the extreme ranges of it you know all the way down from like the super low guttural type growls to those like high pitched screams are those just different variations of the fry or are they, or are they totally different things? Um, I would say that really depends on what you want to um, achieve like sound wise. Like I know many people who use fry techniques um, to go into the higher ranges and super high ranges. And I know a lot of people who use like the, the false chords and transform that into a low pitch gutturals. But I also know people who can go very, very low on a fry sound and who can go very high on a false chord sound. So those two techniques like they um, come naturally for some pitches, but you can really transform them and bring them also to the low end and to the high end. So that's totally up to you. And I would, I would probably say that um, uh, the false chord sounds a little bit more grainy. It's a little thicker in sound as more mass is vibrating, um, as opposed to the fry, which which 
come brings in like a finer a finer grain it's more like a noisier sound like fry you know like french fries into oil <laughs> so yep <laughs> <laughs> it's an aesthetic and it's up to you and what you need in your songs excellent yeah thank you for for clarifying that and kind of sticking on somewhat of this this same topic you know i, I had this the, kind of going into this 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 understanding that you know there isn't just like a scream that's like one size fits all right like it's you know, you use different styles of music, there's different genres, and maybe you want to, um, you know, kind of find your own style, but kind of that also fits into like a good, you know, genre or, or style of, of, of extreme music. And so what I'm curious about is, you know, how, how would someone who maybe is more interested in like, you know, death metal or metalcore or grindcore or hardcore, whatever the genre may be, you know, how, how should they maybe approach this course? Is this, may, is this course going to ultimately kind of give them a good foundation on which they can build and kind of take this into spe their own specific styles? Or does this kind of go into those more specific genres as well? I would say it's um, it's giving you a solid basis to start with. So um, we're starting with just simply producing a harsh vocal sound um, on different techniques. And then I explain how um, you can build up upon that because um, while the, the the main like distortion sound itself is like produced like in your vocal box in your larynx when it's coming it's coming from here this is not the part where you shape the sound or where you give it a certain color so when you when you are looking at grindcore um, with these very throaty sounds this is a shaping technique that happens more like in the back of your of your mouth and um, you use your tongue a lot and pull it back and curl it backwards to achieve these sounds. Um, as opposed to when it comes to very thrash medley uh, vocals where it's just like raspy, uh, I would say your tongue is more flat and that timbre that comes in, it's a little, it's a little lighter um, and probably a little more, um, I don't know, higher pitched. So it, it really, um, I give you the recipe and the dough, but if you make cake or bread, um, that's up to you. But I also give hints uh, and clues like um, what to look for and in what direction to, to look and to train um, for achieving a certain sound. Excellent. I love the, the, the dough analogy. You, you give us the recipe, what we do with it is, is our own thing. So that, that's great. Thank you for that. I was actually reading in a recent interview uh, that you did uh, just a couple months ago with uh, on metalgoddesses.com. Um, and, and it was a great interview. Um, and I, I, you know, I learned that you have a nickname, which is, I guess, apparently on your ID. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but that was, that was an interesting, uh, just kind of like little tidbit I didn't know. But uh, what I ultimately wanted to kind of get, get a little bit uh, of clarity on, or maybe just have you elaborate on a little bit, is when you were talking about the music and, and how Hyrus is, is a, a more melodic thing than what you have typically done in your career. And something that really stood out to me was uh, something that you said. I'm just going to read what you said here. And it says, here and there, clean vocals would have probably fit, but my trademark are simply my harsh vocals. I have to say, though, I've been using them pretty melodically. And that really stuck out to me because, you know, obviously a lot of you know people going into this as newbies like myself, you think of harsh vocals and melody as like two completely different things. And so what I was curious about is, could you maybe elaborate on what you mean by that and you're using your harsh vocals in a more melodic way? I mean, two things um, by that. Um, for one, it's like mm, high res is a melodic death metal band. Critical Mass is a more like old school death metal band. And the way vocals are woven into both these genres differs. So um, while I'm more trying to be a glue between guitars and drums, um, sort of like, like bass sound uh, kind of approach um, in, in Critical Mess, uh, and also be like more staccato, be like more percussive the way I use my vocals there, I would say that I um, complement the guitars when, it, when it's in melodic death metal. Um, so my vocal approach and also how I write the lyrics for my vocals is a different approach. So, so that's the, 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 the theory behind that. Excellent. Or the aesthetic. And so when, I, when it comes to choosing the right technique for that, um, I would say that um, it is easier and it sounds to my ears better when you mix more like the fry vocals with, um, with a clean sound or with a melodic sound where you actually sing notes. Um, 
as opposed to singing um, false chord vocals um, that allow your voice to be punchier, to have maybe even a little more attack and a thickness to it. So in Critical Mess, I would say I use like 80% false chord sounds and then add fry to that. And in high res, I use 80% fry sounds and then add false chords to that. Excellent. Thank you for elaborating on that. And as kind of a follow-up to that, um, you know, the very first thing that, that I read here that, you know, from, from your quote was, you know, uh, here and there clean vocals would have probably fit. Could we see a high risk song in the, in, in the future where there are clean vocals? There is one song on the album that has a snippet of clean vocals in the end where I couldn't resist the temptation. Oh, okay. You know, like... I would never say never. Like um, I listen to the songs uh, and listen to the demos, and then whatever sparks, I let it happen. I have learned that um, you know, rolling with what comes in creative, creatively um, is most of the time the best um, suit for the song. So I try to not bend it too much. Uh, but yeah, why not? Let's see. Let's see what's coming. Like I love clean vocals. Um, I'm not. Probably, uh, probably my screams are better than my clean vocals, but um, I'm always learning. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, as, as we all are, right? So th this is an interesting topic here, just to kind of shift gears slightly. It's still technique based. I I've seen where other, you know, really popular vocalists, uh, you know, Matt Heafy is one of them, the, the vocalist for, for Trivium, has, has described how he uses different techniques live than he does in the studio. And so it just kind of had me curious. You know, I'm wondering, do you use a similar you know, uh, process or style where you use one technique live and a different one in the studio? Sometimes I do that. Um, um, for one, it's just an emotional thing. Sometimes, I don't know, like uh, uh, I, I can't hold it back and I throw in like pig squeals like everywhere because it's a pig squitty night, like it was Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's just like, it, it's just a certain mood um, that I do that. And, and then of course, there are some things that you can do in a studio that are not that, that easy to achieve live for especially like layering vocals. So, so when I'm laying, layering, layering vocals, um, meaning that I, I um, layer some higher pitched fry sounds um, and give it a thicker bass um, with some false chords, I um, create a certain uh, sound in the listener's ear that I cannot create using only one of the te techniques. So I either choose, I start on a fry and lean into a false chord or the other way around, or I, or I choose like a mix between a fry and a false chord to achieve like a thicker fry sound. So um, I don't know if, if this is what Matt was talking about, but this is um, something that, um, that I do a lot, that I, that I try to uh, create a sound that you hear, but not necessarily in the way that it was created in the studio. Got it. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you for, for describing it. It was just, it was just something I happened to read. Um, I don't remember exactly where I saw it, Instagram maybe, but, uh, he was kind of talking about, you know, using those two different techniques. So it had me curious. So next question is, and you've already kind of touched on this, uh, at the very beginning when I asked you about just kind of overall what we would learn in the course. Um, but I know warming up, is absolutely essential basically for anything but especially for vocals and i can imagine it's even especially more critical for doing extreme vocals making sure you're warming up properly um so with that in mind can you maybe talk a little bit about maybe some of the techniques that you use and what could we be seeing and learning more uh in your course um first of all i would like to clarify that um i personally do not think that um, harsh vocals um, have the bad reputation that they sometimes have, especially from people who don't know how to sing them. That's me. Uh, because like singing harsh vocals has nothing to do with having a hammer fall on your toe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, um, it's, it's like um, we are creating distortion and distortion is what we hear. We do not distort anything here. So um, the warm up is very similar to a warm up for clean vocals, and I am looking. I'm looking at the warm up like a pyramid. You know, like I have a solid breathing technique. On top of that, like I have a solid projection um, that brings me into the right mood, and then I slowly build up on that. So the warm up and also the cool down afterwards um, is essential and pretty boring. So I start with a very light hum with closed mouth to ensure um, nasal airflow, like. 
Not even on notes. I mean, you can do that on scales, but you don't really need to. Yeah. And then I build up uh, upon that. And um, I yawn a lot. I do lip rolls like... All the good stuff. Yep. And um, yeah, I, I just make sure that my body, my mental state, my mind and my voice are working together well, like a clockwork. And that's the state... Um, when I start to uh, bring in my growls, my screams, and I start with vowels, like with all kinds of vowels, all the vowels that we know in the alphabet, but all the vowels in between as they transition into each other. And then um, I usually pick like something easy to sing, something that I find easy. And then I pick the hardest part of what I have to sing in that set that I'm about to perform. Um, and I try that a couple times until it works. And then I, if when I'm lucky enough and there's enough time, I have a half an hour break before I go on stage. Wow. Yeah. So I knew there was going to be a good bit to the warm up, and, and I knew it was going to be important, just as you mentioned, for any style of vocal. Um, and, and like you mentioned, I am that total, the total noob who, who doesn't like understand how the extreme vocals work. So thank you for that explanation. But again, I'm, I'm very excited to learn as part of this course. So uh, hopefully... Uh, you know, I'll have a better understanding in the, in the coming months as I dive into this thing. Kind of touching on one more topic that um, is 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 probably pretty common amongst you know anyone who does any sort of vocals, but you know breath control, right? Um, you know, I've 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 kind of dabbled in learning about you know vocals and and breathing and warm ups and stuff, and and I understand a lot kind of comes from the gut. But you know, what what more can you tell us about? you know, breath control when it comes to extreme vocals? And again, kind of, you know, what are some of the things you may be touching on in your course? Well, breathing and um, breathing in a certain way as a singer brings out all the good stuff in your voice. And it also protects you from harming your voice, especially um, in harsh vocals where we use a lot of um, excess pressure to kick certain body parts in and to get them to vibrate. We need to make sure that we are experts in breathing and breathing support. So I'm always telling my students that their vocal health is mainly coming from the work and how well you do it in this area. And while many people think that um, it's, it comes from the gut, um, <laughs> they try to, they, they lean forward in sort of like a, um, like a sit up motion when they exhale, like, la. Um, well, this is actually doing the opposite of good breathing support because what we want to do is we want to try to be wide in our rib cage and have it, have it expanded while we are exhaling. So in order to um, keep it ex in this expanded state and not have it like to fall to, to like, you know, like deflate too much, we have to engage our back muscles. And the feeling that you can have when you exhale on a long note or on a proper growl is like you're actually growing. And this is more like a marathon that you have to do there as opposed to like really something, you know, bodybuilding strength that you, that you need a lot of muscle for that. Um, you need a lot of endurance and um, you need to make sure that you keep that posture. Look at opera singers. You will not find a single opera singer on this planet being like all like crunched up and crunched down at the end of an aria, you know. It's not going to happen. And um, this is something that I look a lot at um, on, like, as my um, inspiration for like proper posture and breathing support. Excellent. Well, again, thank you for elaborating on that and, and you know, talking through some of those, the, the breath control and stuff. And as I said, it comes, I've, I've read it comes from the gut. I, obviously, I was wrong. <laughs> so uh, there's, I've got a lot to learn still. But again, I'm still excited to, to dive into this and learn more. All right. And so my, my next question uh, has to do with the actual microphone used, uh, you know, especially when it comes to getting different uh, sounds or, or doing different styles of extreme vocals. And and I've seen on YouTube, uh, as I mentioned before, I've kind of dabbled in this and looked around and watched some videos online on how to do different screams. And one thing that stuck out to me was people using different styles of microphones. And so it just kind of piqued my curiosity. And I was wondering, you know, what what role does the microphone play in getting different styles of, of sounds? Um, yeah, I would say that especially live, um, it's a very, also a very personal thing um, to, to, to look for. Um, 
I really encourage my students like to go to their, you know, like their local music store and plug in all the microphones that they can find and just find their right fit for their particular voice. Also um, in metal and in harsh vocals, especially like in the extreme metal scene, I would say it's very common that you, you cup your microphone, that you really like close it off at the end and have like only like a little hole left where you are like in. Um, to just shape away all the lighter sounds that you don't want and to create a certain hollowness uh, with it. And some microphones um, are more useful for that purpose than others. So I would say that, um, like I personally, I'm using a super cardioid um, microphone that um, is more, um, I would say, yeah, prominent to, to produce some feedbacks when you don't handle it well. So I would say that you need to Look at what do you want to do on stage um, and then pick the right microphone for that. And I know many singers who, who don't, who are maybe too lazy or don't think that it's necessary to um, uh, get used to how to handle a microphone and what the characteristic of the microphone is. They don't know how to, how to set up their monitors, their, their wedges. Um, so that's a crucial factor um, for, for your live show. So um, that's really something that I encourage my, my students to do. And um, yeah, that's a good thing for a singer to know. Excellent. And kind of just taking it, uh, extending this question, maybe just uh, one step further. Um, so something that I'm pretty passionate about is uh, music production and, and mixing, um, and hopefully in the future too, uh, even, even recording as well. And something that I've been reading a lot about is how... Um, but different producers as they're getting ready to, or, or different uh, producers and engineers as they're getting ready to maybe track vocals uh, for metal bands with, you know, with extreme style of styles of vocals, um, they will actually ask the, you know, the singer, what, what style of microphone do they prefer? And maybe that has to go with, you know, what you were just saying about, you know, having that connection with the microphone. Um, but something that st stood out to me was how you know, if if the if the if the vocalist decided on a condenser mic, they would put it on a stand, and the vocalist would never touch it. Obviously, you know, uh, condenser mics are that way. Whereas if it's a uh, like a Shure SM7B, they would just they would put it in the singer's hand, and they would literally hold on to it as they're tracking. Um, and, and so I'm curious, like, which which style do you use, and have you tried both in the studio like that? Yes, I have. I've, I've tried both. Um... When the the first time that I ever went into a recording um, studio, I wasn't allowed to touch the microphone at all because like it would pick up like all the all the grabbing sounds and it was very um, um, delicate to handle. And I didn't feel comfortable with that because like the only experience I had as a singer was live on stage or in the rehearsal room, but both would work with a microphone in my hand. So I was feeling like kind of like I have to hold on to something. Yeah. Um, that has changed over the years, but I must say that um, I'm using an SM7B, um, like the standard for like harsh vocals, I would say. Um, I'm using that a lot. And um, one of the reasons why I picked that was um, because it's so forgiving. You can have it in your hand and it won't pick up like too much of the noises. Um, and it feels very, you know, very natural uh, to, to have it and like to sing energetic into that microphone. But then again, like, you know, I record during the day, like maybe five or six hours and it's tiring because it's a heavy thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just because it got too heavy, like I am, um, I more and more got used to having it on a stand. And um, so, so nowadays I have it probably like 90% on a stand. And then just for some screams, I, I, I put it into my hand and also with my students when I record them. Um, like I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the decision uh, up to them, but it's really just what you're used to. And also in the past two years where the opportunities to play live um, weren't so <laughs> yeah. that just what was taken away from us, I have recorded uh, so much more often in the studio than I had before because I was doing so many collaborations and trying out new stuff that I feel a lot more comfortable um, in the studio. And this has taught me a lesson that um, it's one thing to go into a studio only to record your vocals for a record. And that might happen every other year or every three years, or you have even more time in, in between. 
And then it's really, really uncomfortable to suddenly stand there, stand still and take care of how, how close you are to the microphone and everything. So if you record yourself in between, also in the learning phase, um, this will make it easier for you to give your 110% in the studio when we're talking about creating an album. And uh, yeah, this is something it has to do with a lot of discipline, but it pays off. That is fantastic advice and, and something I'm sure, you know, we would only experience. And I say we as, you know, people just kind of starting out with this and looking to, you know, potentially get into doing this, this these type of, uh, of vocals and, and, and learning from your course, you know, that, that's something that, I feel like is is probably not relayed the best in the best way through a course like this. Like you actually have to experience it and and be there um, and and just as you said, practicing recording yourself and figuring out what's comfortable and, and the different styles. That's just something you're going to have to learn with experience. So that's great advice. Thank you for that. Exactly, and also um, so many people are focusing on their microphone, but especially in the studio, um, I can only speak from my experiences. But the microphone has a certain impact in the way it's set up, but the um, way that you hear yourself, um, what are you using on your ears or in your ears, is also a, um, a very crucial factor. And um, like it's, it's something completely different to have like these headphones or these headphones, and then you're used to your earbuds that you use every day, and then the sound is so different. So that's also a crucial factor to, um, that you have to um, look at when you train that another fantastic piece of information that we probably would only get with experience. So thank you for sharing that as well. Uh, all right. So th my next couple questions um, are actually from users of a discord server that, uh, that I have, it's called the studio. Um, there's about 150 people in it. And I just gave them all a, a, an announcement earlier this week that I'm going to have a very special uh, guest on the channel. And if they had any questions about extreme vocals to, to send me messages, I got a couple back. Um, and one has to do with kind of, kind of somewhat breathing. And then the other one is more of like a, a production based type question, but I want to read these to you and, and just kind of get your responses here. And so the first one comes from user Joey M. Uh, and he, he said, I'm getting more comfortable with my fry screams, but false chords I feel are letting too much air through and can't sustain as long. Anything specific to help develop breath support working false chords? That's a great question. Um, First of all, um, I, we have to um, make a distinction between are you using too much air um, that is not transformed into sound? So are you really hearing a sound that is coming through in your false chord? Or is it more like that you feel your false chord should be as long as your fry sound because false chords use a lot, they need a lot more air than uh, fry sounds. So like um, for most people, the false chord sound will be much shorter than the longest fry sound. So we need to also choose wisely when we um, write a song and we have a certain sound aesthetic in mind. Is that even <laughs> singable in the technique that we choose? So um, when, when you have the problem that you hear like a hissing sound in the, in the false chord, um, it might be the case yet yeah, that you're too constricted in that area, especially when you um, sing fry a lot. You are used to a lot of compression. It's very com a very compressed sound. Um, opposed to that, the false chord sound has a lot more release everywhere. So it's really like you know, as if you're like. On a like on a busy day, you're at home and you're just like sinking on the couch, like Ugh. so. It's really Ugh. you're just kind of leaning into that sound and make sure that the constriction is gone when you do that. So the next thing that you can do is you work on your clean sound and you um, make sure that the hissing sound that you maybe hear in your false chord sound is not there when you sing on a comfortable clean note. Mm -hmm. trying to make it as clear as possible. Um, and if you have that, take the same note and place your false chord on top of it and go easy on that. Just don't, don't worry about um, the sound quality yet. Just kick your false chords in on that comfortable sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And once you feel comfortable with that, you can start like shaping with your mouth and make like more awkward um, or intense sounds with it. But keep in mind that the tension here should never be in a way that this is hard. <coughs> it's loose. It should be loose. That is absolutely amazing. I cannot wait to be able to do that myself. Like <laughs> that's, I want to be able to do that so bad. Uh, all right. So the, the next question, as I hinted to before, is, is less of a, it actually has nothing to do with technique. It's more just like you know, in the studio. And, and this comes from someone who has aspirations similar to myself, you know, production and mixing and engineering kind of studio related recording and stuff. Um, but this is the question and it comes from user Lenny Mo, who asks how much post-production and editing is, is involved in extreme vocals and what, if anything, can you tell us about a typical vocal chain and, and how that plays in the final result in, in the productions that we hear? I don't have producer skills. Um, I record myself um, and I edit my own vocals before I give them in the studio most of the time, not all of the time. And my chain is like pretty short. Like I only have a, um, uh, an ISO one focus ride. Um, and then my microphone. So that's it. I don't do any pre-processing with my vocals. I'll leave that up to the people who know what they're doing. Um, but it really depends. Um, of course, you can um, do a lot with your vocals, just like in, with any kind of vocals. Um, it's what kind of aesthetic are you, are, you, um, are you looking for? Are you more of a fan of like um, are you doing like an industrial kind of metal? Are you, are you doing an old school death metal? That all plays a factor in um, the choice of the chain and how much you want to um, work the, um, the vocals. I um, use more than just one layer of vocals um, most of the time. So in order that I can create a certain, um, you know, like room atmosphere, when I record only one, one vocal track, I have it in the middle. And then to create a certain room, I need to add like a reverb to it. And the reverb will sometimes kind of like soften out the harshness in the vocals. So in order to avoid that a little bit is I, I record like one main track for, for the center that will hit you just right here. And then I will have two more that I put to the right and to the left, but not um, like a chorus effect. I don't use them as a chorus effect, just like to create the illusion that the sound is actually bouncing off the wall, like in a room that gives you the feeling of a room. So then I don't have to use as much reverb um, or other effects to blend in with the guitars. Um, so that's something that I, that I have learned from my studio experiences. And other than that, yeah, of course, compression, good compression is always good um, uh, to add to that. But yeah, everything else I need to leave, leave up to the, to the experts. I'm really not an expert in, in, in studio production. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, a lot of that was already great, though. You know, even, even talking about, um, and I would consider this, you know, kind of like somewhat post-production related stuff is just like knowing how and when to layer things, as you described, and, when, you know, when to use different style effects and stuff. So that was a great answer. Thank you for that. Um, so I've already asked you a ton about the different techniques and breathing control and, and warmups and a bunch of stuff uh, about this course, but I figured I would just kind of give you an open-ended question and, and an opportunity to just say anything else that maybe you wanted to say about this course to everyone who's watching this video. Um, you know, go ahead and, and, and sell the thing. You're like, what, what else uh, would you like everyone to know who's watching this video about, you know, about this course? I try um, to be a good teacher for my students and, um, and the main focus that I have is I try to find something that is unique in the students, um, in the students voice that can become like a trademark or something or something that, that it feels very something that you want to hear more of. And this is something that I cannot do in a video course, of course, but I want to invite everyone who watches the course to um, pay good attention to their own voice. And if you want to achieve a certain sound, make sure it's yours and not someone else's sound. Um, and, um, and what's also part of the course is like, rather than, um, um, you know, like um, putting yourself in a position where you aim at a certain sound, find a suitable creature for the voice that you have 
and create the image to the voice that you have and follow that path. Um, other than like, you know, like being like all, um, um, uh, intimidated by pressure that you put on yourself. So that's what I want to give to everyone who's learning any kind of singing style, because this is your own voice. It's unique. You cannot change it. So you can work with that and it will just be the best path that you can walk on. Excellent answer. Uh, so that is all my questions. Uh, for today. And, and Britta, I want to thank you once again for taking the time to come on the channel and talk with me about your new course and about extreme vocals. I, I, as I mentioned, but many times I'm very, very much looking forward to getting into this and learning these, you know, these techniques that you've, that we just talked about in this video. And, you know, I, I would extend an offer, you know, if any time in the future you want to come back on and, uh, and maybe you can take a look at my progress and, and I can play you some audio samples or something and you can critique those. You know, the, the offer is always there to come back on and, and talk extreme vocals anytime. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure um, talking to you. And thanks for all the great questions. Also um, for the questions that um, you guys on Discord sent. Like, um, yeah, send them my best regards and I'm happy to answer more. Just throw you, the, your questions at me. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So yeah, thanks again for coming on. Um, and have an excellent day. You too. Take care. Take care. <laughs> if you are looking to learn extreme vocals, then find the link in the description below to Britta's extreme vocal course on ProMix Academy. If you liked this video, do me a favor and hit that like button down below and consider subscribing to my channel for more great content like this in the future. With that, I want to thank you for watching and thank you for your support.